All right, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Um, we are really, really excited uh, to have uh, Mr. Panas Lado here from the European Commission, and he is the director of uh, the Commission for Fisheries and Maritime Affairs. He's been at the European Commission since 1980s and has just a really distinguished career and has been um, in his current position for a number of years. And he's here to talk about um, the EU fisheries and, and potential for reform. And it's perfect timing because we're going to be talking about it in my class this week. And so this will really um, flow into that. And, and, you know, there's been a lot of controversy. And as someone who, who reads a lot, it, you know, I'm, I've just been really looking forward to this talk to get from the inside perspective um, so I can kind of sort out the fact from the fiction. So uh, let's give uh, uh, Mr. Panaspato a big warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, today, I'm, this afternoon, I'm going to talk about uh, fisheries, but not fisheries as such, but fisheries as an example or as, as a showcase of policy making. And I want to start with something perhaps more catchy than a sardine or something like that, which is Brexit. We're not going to talk about Brexit this afternoon, that's a bit more. However, what is important is to understand that Brexit somehow encapsulates everything that in Europe, not only in the UK, but in general in Europe, is the criticism and the bad image of the European Union. You probably don't understand too much about the European Union. Here in the United States, well, you as students of international affairs certainly are a lot more sophisticated than the regular consumer of news. But in Europe, I can tell you, most of the times that we see news about the European Union is always to regret the failures that the political leaders of the European Union have not been able to reform this, have not been able to find a solution, have not been able to do the job. So there is a, a kind of general feeling that the Union has become a body, 28 member states, as you know, that has become so complicated that it really becomes almost impossible for it to move, to reform itself, when and where it is necessary, and so on and so forth. So is this the case? And over and beyond the um, case of, uh, of Brexit, you know that uh, this is supposed to be Mr. Cameron, the ex-Prime uh, Minister, saying that, well, basically, small reform is not good enough. The EU needs to you know, turn around completely, and that somehow gives a certain taste of what is the European society today, not only from outside, but especially from inside. And many people, particularly young people who haven't seen the development of this fascinating project over the years, think that the European Union is something too complicated, uh, that is always failing to decide on things, and uh, that especially that is impossible to reform. And for example, John, uh, David Cameron, prior to the referendum on Brexit, try to reform the EU, to offer the British citizens a better deal for Britain in the EU. And you see that he was not mocked by the results. Even though I think mm. that the reform that was done to please the UK was quite impressive and went to the limit of what other member states, such as Poland, for example, could accept in terms of the reform of the freedom of circulation of citizens within the countries of the EU. So that is a little bit of background criticism EU impossible to reform. But is this true? Is this a, the EU is so difficult to reform? So I'm going to talk this afternoon about the specific case of the reform of the common fisheries policy. And I'm going to do it for two reasons. First of all, because this is what I do, so I was in charge of the reform. So I, perhaps it's difficult to find somebody with more experience than I, than I have in this uh, thing. But secondly, because this uh, reform was somehow a showcase of what the EU could do to show that it can change itself quite dramatically and also to show to the UK that well, what you say that the policies are bad your reform is not true. You think this policy is bad? Fair enough. We're going to change it, we're going to reform it, we're going to demonstrate to you that you can stay in the Union and you can actually contribute to change in a positive way those policies you don't agree. So this was important over and beyond fisheries itself. The fisheries sector is tiny in Europe, as it is in the United States. Less than 0.5% of GDP is what the fisheries economy represents in the Union. So, hardly impressive. However, the 
Common fisheries policy is an extremely meaningful policy for political reasons over and beyond the economic weight of the fishing sector in, in the European Union. It's, first of all, it's one of the five exclusive uh, um, competences. You know that in the Union, if you read Article 3 of the Treaty of Lisbon, you see a list of the exclusive club, club a limited club of the uh, exclusive competences. Uh, those are the uh, market policy, the common customs policy, the competition policy, and the monetary policy uh, for the countries that have the euro as currency, and the management of fishery resources under the common fisheries policy. So the small fish is politically extremely significant is one of five exclusive competence. Exclusive competence means that member states in Italy cannot regulate or legislate because this is only legislated at European level. So it is very important that we have to get this policy right over and beyond the importance of the policy of the uh, policy because of the political significance of being able to modify it positively a policy that is one of the exclusive of the club of um, exclusive companies. Then, was it so bad? I mean, did the Brits have such a strong point in saying that the policy was bad? Well, actually, yes, kind of. I think that they have a point, not only them, but this is a policy that was badly needing a reform for a number of reasons that are also, in some cases, highly significant in policy terms over and beyond fisheries themselves. And you know that there's a poor decision making. This is a policy that the industry always saw that as when all the technical decisions are taken by those guys in Brussels, those bureaucrats who are very far removed from the realities of the fishing grounds. And therefore, the policy had, at this image, well deserved, I would tell you, think, of a policy that is decided, even at technical level, by ministers and other people in a setting completely far removed from reality. Then, the no buy in by stakeholders, and then certain specific questions that are certainly not in objective terms, the most important figures of the policy, but that in the process of development of this policy of the years became by far the main reputational issue for the policy. And that was the amount of fiscal. Fiscal is you know, all the amount of good fish, perfectly healthy, perfectly eatable, that is for a certain number of reasons, both legislative and economic, is just thrown back to the sea. And this at some stage become, became so publicly unacceptable for the European society that was an, out, an outcry, a policy that leads fishermen actually to throw back to the sea a 15 kilo cod fish is a bad policy. So at some stage, even if in objective terms this discarding thing was not really the biggest problem of the policy, it was certainly the biggest reputational issue. So we need to do something about it because it was not only the, uh, the bad reputation of the policy itself, but by extension, it was a reputational issue for EU policy making at large. Because there, uh, uh, unlike other, other questions, everyone would point their finger at Brussels because that is an exclusive competence. So we have no excuse saying that, well, this is somebody else's fault. We can say this, and member states do this all the time, but fisheries who couldn't possibly say this. So we needed actually to bring about a strong reform of this. Just a, a brief description of this policy, just in what is particularly relevant in terms of policy making. Uh, this is a policy that manages a common resource, and you easily understand why. Uh, a haddock or a whiting or any other fish swimming through the North Sea. Uh, right now it's in Dutch waters, in a couple of hours it's in Belgian waters, then it gets to French waters, then to UK waters. So whose fish is this? This is a common resource that swims across the waters of all uh, riparian states in the Union, and therefore it's a common responsibility to manage. Then uh, we have a certain number of rules, but I think that it is uh, important to understand that it is uh, since 1983, when uh, it was established, one of the most integrated EU policies is a policy that is decided not through the legal instrument of the directives, that as you know are a legal instruments to simply uh, harmonize national legislations. Here we use all the time uh, 
regulations, which means that every single detail of how you can fish, how much you can fish, under which conditions you can fish, where you can fish, this is all decided in this policy in process. So highly centralized policy, highly um, detailed policy. And then, and this is also very important, however, although this job of managing the resources is done at uh, a process level, member states still keep quite a lot of responsibility on the road. And perhaps the best example is that once the policy established how much cod will the UK be able to fish next year, then how do you distribute this cod? The UK cod among British fishermen. That is done entirely by the UK, not by Brussels. So within the general management of common resources, there's a certain number of decisions that stay, even in an exclusive policy, stay under the responsibility of the member states. And this is extremely important because, as we will see in the, in the next uh, slide, the policy had also a reputational problem, in some cases completely undeserved. Yes, I said at the beginning we needed to improve the policy and we needed to discard things that was sort of um, uh, discrediting the policy. But at the same time, this is a policy that lent itself a lot to what we call in Europe, the Euro myths that exist in many member states, but particularly in the UK. And that's why I mentioned Brexit in, in, at the very beginning. Just for example, the EU failed to recover the iconic North Sea stock headlines in, in not only the specialized press, this is a disaster, Europe a disaster, but who actually takes that decision? Then you look into that and you see that the decisions are made by the ministers. And who has led a bad decision in the Council of Ministers on this stock? It just happens to be the UK minister. Yet, it is Brussels that is blamed and not the British minister. For it. So this is a very typical phenomenon of this. And we have many other examples, just that I'm not going to read them through. And this is a policy that in which we can apply, perhaps more than any, any, any other one, this principle that we call nationalizing success and European, Europeanizing failure. So everything that is good, we need it, national authorities. Everything that is bad, those guys in business. So this policy suffered from this, and this is a phenomenon that I can hardly complain about it because we, even we, officials of the European Commission, have contributed by accepting this law of permanent scapegoats of all the enemies that happens in Europe and then covering the back of the national politicians. We've done this for years. So then the Commission did something. So then, for these reasons, we needed to change the policy, as I said at the beginning. How did we start? Then I think that in terms of policy making and young fisheries, we started by doing something that was, I would say, quite unusual in Europe, which is to be extremely self-critical. This is the, um, the uh, green book on the reform of the CFP, in which, if you are used to the jargon of the European Union, we included a language which was exceptionally critical with our own policy. And that we, officials of the Commission, actually can get so critical with the policy, it came as a surprise. And it kind of shattered all images that people had about it. And we were so self-critical about this that even many fishermen associations said, well, you don't have to discredit the policy so much. It actually is not that bad. You have overdone it a little bit. So we actually started by, we need to start to shake up people around in group we want a, 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 a serious form of the policy. We will do something that is not done generally in the European Union. The European Union is traditionally very politically correct, very soft spoken. We never give nice headlines to uh, journalists. Journalists in Brussels always complain that all the uh, headlines we give them are extremely boring. Always <laughs> in extremely, you know, bland, politically correct terms. But there, we took the opposite approach. We said, we want a radical reform. Let's do this differently and let's be self-critical. To the point that, as I said, many people in the said, we actually overdid it. So that was element one in terms of policy making. You want a big reform, 
don't hesitate to be self-critical. Because you set the tone of what will be an ambitious change. Then, to address some of the failures that I mentioned very briefly, we propose a certain number of changes in the policy, but I will summarize these two ones because they are perhaps the two that are most significant. One of them, the regionalization, in terms of the modalities for policy making in the Union, and the second one, because it was about trying to resolve a big reputational issue. So one of them was about uh, policy making, the other was, uh, was about how can we handle mediatic uh, uh, issues that become a reputational problem for the Union. All the rest of the elements, I think, we can leave them out, but of course, if somebody's interested, I can speak about this. So try to concentrate on, this, on these two things. Why did we want to, re to regionalize? This is kind of funny, because um, certain people and some of the problems that we had uh, in the CFP uh, were actually suggesting that we should regionalize the policy. Normally, the policy was one where all the ministers from all the member states got together and took decisions applicable to all 28 member states and to all cities in surrounding. Is this good? Then there were different views of what a regionalized policy would be. Actually, we had, first of all, a wrong idea in the European Commission, which was to say, we need to regionalize the policy to address this problem that I showed at the beginning of the micromanagement for Brussels. If the people has the impression that this is managed by those guys far removed from reality, uh, meeting in Brussels at a uh, negotiation at 5 o'clock in the morning, then we need to bring decision making at least on more technical matters to a more decentralized setting closer to the decision grounds, closer to the stakeholders. So that was our intention. We understood this, that the policy was too centralized. We have to find a way to bring it down to much closer uh, level to the, to the reality to the decision grounds. That was our motivation. Then all the motivation was basically uh, the UK motivation which was basically devolution. In the UK, they hated that so many things are decided in Brussels. No matter that at the end, the decision in Brussels is not influenced by the UK minister. But the decision is probably taken in Brussels, and they want decisions to be repatriated to London. So the UK saw this regionalization thing as, well, can we take a certain number of decisions in this policy from Brussels back to not just one capital, but at least a group of capitals within the region that will agree on common measures. So the motivation we see uh, in the UK is not exactly the same as that motivation. Then we have other, this, other motivations, and I'm not writing the member states there, because this just, I'm still a, a, an acting official. So, but for example, France and Spain clearly said it, although I've never write it, that you know the policy, the common fisheries policies, main decisions are decided by co-decision. You know what co-decision is? Decisions through a negotiation between the European Parliament and the Council of Ministers. Then, these two member states and perhaps others thought that decisions taken by that bunch of ignorance in the European Parliament, in which barely 10 people out of more than 700 actually have an idea about it. It is within the treaty, we cannot formally go against it, but the more decisions we take out of co decision, the better. So the motivation of the was actually not to bring decisions uh, back home or to uh, bring them to the stakeholders. It was actually basically to remove them from Parliament. And then a last decision or a last motivation of this decision was that of the fishing industry, which says, but we are fed up of important, even technical decisions being taken by these guys in Brussels by these politicians and those officials, we need to ensure that we have a much bigger role in decision making, because we are the ones who know the business, we are the ones who know the decision grounds. And therefore, the decision making to take it away from Brussels to a kind of different setting closer to the decision grounds was also for the industry a way to remove powers and decision making powers from politicians in Brussels or politicians in the world capitals and bring them back. So you see that regionalization, different actors are 
different motivations and different images of the weapon. So, big thing, we needed to find something that somehow would combine all these four motivations into one. And this has been an unprecedented um, step into developing new forms of uh, decision making in the integrity field. And this has been quite, quite impressive. Not sure that it is necessarily translatable to other policy areas, because to do this, you actually need to be in an exclusive competence area. But certainly, it has been quite, quite inventive. So what we did then, I mean, going through the process of uh, uh, working out regionalization was actually easier said than done, and we had quite a number of difficulties. At least from the point of view of policy making, extremely interesting to examine, it, uh, examine why. For example, some member states said, well, it is clear that if we take out a decision from the Council of Ministers in Brussels or from co decision and bring it back, to a group of capitals on a regionalized basis. Imagine, for example, something that takes place in the Baltic Sea would be decided only by member states in the Baltic, so Poland, Denmark, Sweden, Estonia, and so on. And Spain, France would not intervene. Fine. But then that means that national administrations should work out more. And then it is very funny that everyone wanted regionalization, all their national administration says, yes, admin, uh, regionalization is very good, but then from behind, most member states, in fact, came with difficulties that they would never express in public, but they would certainly tell you in private. So uh, this shows very much the kind of paranoia sometimes in, the, in, the, in the decision making, that ministers and national administrations believe in something, at least as for media, and then have a different position behind that they don't dare express. So we had, for example, some mistrust of the neighbors, for example. This was what I call the Danish album, the day story. Well, taking decisions on just the national administrations. I don't trust the Swedes, so he can just show the polls. So my God, what is this going to be? Then some fear domination by larger, wealthier national administrations. This is what I call the Irish album. Because the Irish, in the middle of the, of the financial crisis in, in Ireland, they were telling me, we are a I mean, small administration, the Irish administration, and broke. We're going to be completely swallowed by the French administration, the UK administration, and so on and so forth. So we don't want it, we prefer the general umbrella of Brussels. Then some fear, regional so nationalization of the CNP, and this was typically the Spanish. The Spanish are obsessed with the idea that they British, the Irish, and the French may kick them out of the waters as far as they call this. Then, this, the fourth is um, uh, the German argument, because they, they the great German position is in German. In Germany, good friend of mine, he told me over a beer, well, this, is, this principle of regionalizing the policy is fine, but then the rest, I have 13 people in Bonn to do this. He tell me how I can do this to 13 people. Just, just you know, very. German were organized. I need so many people to do this. I don't have these people, so I can't do this. End of the story. So, and then the last one that applied to all of them, which is that all our member states are so happy to blame Brussels for everything. This is the nationalizing success and uh, uh, Europeanizing failure. That the day these people will have to take full responsibility for something they decide in you know, Brussels, I mean, many of them are going to shy away. So I think that nobody wanted to recognize it, but actually they fear this. So, and then, well, you know, that uh, for those of you who have, uh, have law studies, there was two other difficulties of a lot of legal nature, but also very serious ones. For example, that uh, if you look into the Treaty of Lisbon, there's nothing, if not at all, the word regionalization. All decisions are taken by the Council of Ministers, all the states, by co legislation, by the commission, but there's not a single word about some kind of regionalized decision. So, how do we do this? And employers were telling us, forget it, this cannot be done, there's no legal decisions. And then, of course, uh, if we had a system whereby member states would, a group of member states would put together a proposal and offer the proposal to the commission, and the commission would have the obligation to rubber stamp it, then this would be against 
the sacrosanct principle of freedom of initiative of the Commission that we, the Commission, defend over and over. So I think, how do we do this? Well, so at the end, I mean, the process was very complicated. I'm, I'm happy to give any comment anybody might be interested in. But at the end, we kind of arrived to a system which is completely unprecedented in Europe. You don't find this kind of thing in any other policy in the European Union. And, and, and then, with these few steps, we believe, and I think successfully, we did the job of putting together all these different things. First of all, you have the policy establishes the main objectives through co-decision, Council of Parliament. This is the normal legislative procedure, so we are respectful of the uh, legal basis. But instead of having all decisions through this procedure, we say only the important bits, only a kind of very restricted number of things are decided by the, regular, the normal regulatory procedure. Then the regulations themselves are adopted by uh, Council of Parliament, they delegate technical decisions uh, to regionalize it. And I, I wrote it this because this is somehow the way to express it in very normal terms. It's not the what. The what is the objective of the policy, and that has to be established by co-decision by the uh, Parliament and Council. It's the how we get there. For example, we want to eliminate altogether catches of juveniles in an area. How do we do it? Is this about flesh sizes? Is this about approach areas? Well, the co-decision only establishes that objective. How do we do it in practice? You ask for your organization to take care of that. So it's the how to do something is not what we do. And then member states, uh, whenever they have something delegated through um, uh, regionalization, they put together a proposal. And that proposal, after compulsory consultation with the advisory council, that means giving the stakeholders a much higher role in deciding what are the technical solutions that to be identified, then these proposals on the how, on how to deliver the objectives, are sent to the Commission, and then the Commission does not, and this is absolutely essential, uh, because the, uh, the most delicate thing, just imagine that the Commission can accept or reject some of the proposals, then this would amount to, again, Brussels deciding again on technical things. If the, uh, the proposal had to be accepted by Brussels, then uh, the Commission would lose the right of initiative. So the way we handled this was to say, well, you member states on a regional basis develop a proposal, you send it to Brussels, and then Brussels cannot cherry pick from what you propose, what we like and what we don't like. If we like it, if it is good enough, if it corresponds to community principles, don't forget that we are the guardian of the treaty, then we put it together as a, as a delegated act, which means we turn it into EU law. And then that becomes EU law. If not, if we believe that what member states have put together actually has a problem, which is that they violate Article 2093 of the treaty. If it's against the treaty, we cannot accept it. But in that case, we don't change that. We simply say, well, this proposal is against the treaty. We cannot accept it like this because we cannot change it. So we turn it into a proposal to be decided by co-decision. So we go back a little bit to square one. If you guys, member states, have not been able to do a decent job of doing a proposal that is compatible with the treaty, our job, no way of accepting this in, in, in those conditions, we go back to uh, square one and we propose it as co-decision. Sorry. So this is the way we did it. And then on the question of the discarding, I think that the discarding was a problem, as I said, and I don't resist the temptation of, of telling the anecdote. The, not this commission, not the previous commission, the former one, John Borch, Maltis, told us once that uh, I want to take a strong um, uh, initiative on eliminating this council. This was, not, uh, this was not coming from the industry. This was not coming from member states. This was coming from public opinion. And why this politician suddenly said, well, I cannot tolerate this anymore. We have to end up with this thing. Well, because his wife, after watching a uh, program on BBC, said, I've seen this job. This is completely unacceptable. We have to finish this. 
So it was a little bit the kind of cultural awareness in Europe, particularly in the UK, but also in many of the member states, in the Netherlands, in Sweden, in many of the member states that, well, this is a social problem. It may not be a problem of fisheries management, but it is a completely unacceptable problem from an ethical point of view. That Europe, when there is so much hunger around the world, is throwing back to the sea about 20, 30 percent of all the fish that is caught. It is a sea. This cannot be accepted. So there was really a kind of outcry that didn't come from the fishing industry, didn't come from the fisheries world. Actually, it came from society, largely agitated by the Europeans, and this is also important to say, the British Eurosceptic that used this to discredit the policy, so, and then the environmental NGOs, who basically uh, made very strong campaigns denouncing the amount of discovery in the fisheries. So that was how this came about. And became something uh, of, of a societal problem that became completely impossible for the European society to accept. So we had to act on it. And how did we do this? Because the member states were not necessarily very enthusiastic, except for a few. The fishing industry was dead against it, because they said, we, I mean, discovery is a fact of life. We cannot handle our fishing activity without discovery. And this is, in, in fact, largely not just an economic practice, but also a consequence of some of the new legislation itself. So for the time being, and this is also very innovative, the Commission decided to play in the media. From this side of the world, you don't, you don't know so much how bad we are in terms of communication. I think that if the easiest thing to do in the world is to mount a media campaign against the EU. It's the easiest thing to do. And whenever we try to defend ourselves with media campaigns, we are so bad at it. We never play this, we are too shy playing it, we must not interfere. Or the Brexit, the line that we had as officials was, don't interfere, please don't say anything. We'll see tomorrow, even when the Brexit uh, campaign was actually presenting incredible lies, we're not authorized to go to the public and say, well, this is a lie. I'm sorry, so it's just. But in this case, actually, the commissioner, Commissioner Damanaki, our former commissioner, Actually, they decided to play in the venue. And this is also extremely new for the, for the um, common fisheries policy and for a European policy in general. There was a media campaign that was actually quite successful and that actually succeeded to mobilize parts of European society in favor of uh, basically the objectives of the reform, not only discarding, but also the objectives of better management, uh, achieving objectives of uh, stock stop conservation, fish stop conservation, and so on and so forth. So I think this is also very important to underline that the Commission, for the first time, played in the media and played with the instruments that normally the opposers to the Union are using on the time. And quite successfully, I would say. Then, the role of the European Parliament was key. The European Parliament is as far as fisheries is concerned, a very special animal. Why? Because you have 750 uh, MEPs, members of the European Parliament, and within that amount of people, there is a fisheries committee composed of uh, 22 people, I think, and only these 22 people have a knowledge of fisheries and have a fisheries constituency. Which means that the fisheries committee proposes something to the plenary on the basis of fisheries but then the decision taken by the plenary is 750 compared to 22. The numbers are such that and the level of ignorance about fisheries issues in most of the people in the European Parliament is such, because they don't have fisheries um, constituencies, that actually the plenary of Parliament votes uh, not along the lines of what the Fisheries Committee has said, but along the lines of what they are lobbied for, or what the societal uh, uh, elements they pick up and lead them to vote to. That meant that while the Fisheries Committee was not very enthusiastic about the, uh, this idea of just a clear bank on, on the discarding, the members of the European Parliament, most of them said, well, discarding, throwing back to fish, they didn't know anything about it, they were lobbied by the NGOs, and they are also lobbied by the uh, European society, Discarded fish, this is unacceptable, this is immoral, this cannot continue in the EU. 
that only those who have fisheries constituencies were given the message from the industry. Well, actually, this is nice, but is it possible to do it in practice? How are we going to do it? Is it going to, to bring lots of problems to us? But the way the European Parliament is uh, structured is such that only 22 out of 750 had a real knowledge or awareness of the practical problems actually to decide this policy. So they massively, for a landslide uh, vote, decided to take part in, yes, a, a completely <coughs> ban on discarding whatever the consequences. Because most of them, not having fisheries constituencies, actually didn't even hear that there would be practical problems for fishing to do this. So this was extremely important. While ministers reflected uh, uh, issues of their, of their own uh, fishing industry, Parliament, for the most part, was actually oblivious to it because they simply did not have a fisheries constituency. Fisheries constituencies in Europe are almost as small as they are in the US. And then, the third actor, without which it is impossible to understand anything that happens today in fisheries policy in Europe. The amount and the investment of environmental NGOs in uh, the policy is impressive. It's huge. And the number of people sometimes we have in the commission services, we have a lot of envy because we are reducing our ranks. We have fewer and fewer officials in the European Commission. And sometimes uh, we meet with uh, NGOs, European NGOs, and they have so many people to do the work that we look at them with envy. You, know, you have so, uh, so, much, so many people, so much resources, that basically they outnumber us in terms of people investing in, in finding out what's best or what's first here for them. So the NGOs, what they did was that they turned what was in, in principle uh, an affair restricted to fisheries communities into an affair of the interest of the general public. <coughs> That's why, through this campaigning, that the members of the European Parliament actually voted what they voted. So they entirely mobilized the European society, and therefore they entirely mobilized the European Parliament. And then, I think that they did this in a certain various ways that I can describe uh, have questions about it, but certainly they were extremely creative and the amount of resources to invest in public campaigns they have is so impressive that again we envy them. We envy the human and financial resources they have for their campaign. And then the result of this is well, in 2013 we adopted uh, a reform. This is Maria Damaraki, who is a well known figure. She made herself extremely popular at the time in Europe. And she was publicly praised by former Prime Minister of Britain, David Cameron, for the excellent reform. So you see now Brexit, that's why I started with Brexit. Right after the reform of the Common Fisheries Policy in 2013, David Cameron congratulated Mariela Maraki and the Commission for the excellent reform of the Common Fisheries Policy. And he said publicly, and he recorded, that this is what the Union needs to do to make the UK happy within the EU. So um, you can understand that after this, and uh, despite all our good efforts, the Brits don't Brexit. That's, that's a source of frustration for me personally because we were so far this. Not just to make the UK happy, but making the UK happy with this was somehow a kind of collateral effect. But you see, at the end of the day, unfortunately, it didn't help us to retain it. Right, so now the question is that, yes, this is, seems to be the story of, um, of uh, success. I've presented it like this. But the story uh, of a change, of such an innovative change, is, will also be the story of how we implement it in our practice. And the next question is that, how we done something that looks very nice on paper, that gets nice headlines, that gets David Cameron praising this uh, reform, and that gets the NGO saying that, yes, well done, Commission, good reform. But then, is this going to work in the real world? Because I think that is about it. I defended myself the idea that, well, what we did, it may look very good on paper, but when it comes to applying it in the real world, it's not going to be that easy. So I think that is somehow something that we have to take into account to evaluate the relative success or failure of the policy. Have we done something that looks fine in the 
uh, headlines in the, in the media, or is something that actually can be applied in the real world? Well, only the ongoing practice will tell. We have been since 2014 actually applying this. Some of the elements of this are just starting to work. It is a little bit premature to say whether this is working or not. But at least, just some reflection, this is a little bit getting into more fishy business. But just to show you that, well, one thing is to have nice headlines. Another thing is to make things work in the real world. Just look at this uh, uh, Celtic Sea bar there. This is real level of this garden. For example, you go to the Baltic on the left hand side, what 5% only. This should be really easy to face out. We don't think that the Baltic will be a problem. And the Celtic Sea reducing more than 40% of this garden. Why not? The Norwegians, for example, who are not in the Union, they have been applying a non-discard policy like ours for more than 20 years. And of course, they all claim a success in public, but then you talk to them over a year, and they tell you, well, perhaps 50% of in the world. So are we going to get the job done in practice? And in areas such as the uh, Celtic Sea, are we going to reduce catches, by catches, and discards to zero? We'll see. And if we can't, then all the next nice headlines will they translate into a kind of um, uh, further criticism for the union because what we have done it looks well, uh, it looks good on paper, but actually it does not translate into reality. So there might be a kind of political backlash. Who knows? Probably in five years' time, I will be able to give a more precise idea of what's happening. Then another question. Um, the influence of the NGOs has been instrumental in getting through the reform. But the level of ambition and the level of demand by the NGOs and the expectations of the NGOs are so high and so demanding that even if we get a reasonably good result, what is the image that we're going to give to the outside world and to the European public opinion? even if we get a pretty good result. I think that um, just the, the level of scrutiny of the policy by the NGOs in Europe, I think is now perhaps overcoming the US. I mean, it has become completely out of control. And now, the question is that even if we get a reduction of this kind, for example, or a reduction of, or a, a reduction of the overfishing that we still have in some fisheries, to acceptable levels, but not exactly the top levels that the NGOs are advocating, are we going to get a relatively good result that is going to be presented by NGOs still as a policy thing? I think this is a huge challenge and we have to work a lot on it. Incidentally, in Seattle I'm in contact with uh, Professor Ray Kilborn, who's telling me that in the West Coast of the US we have exactly the same problem. So I think that we'll work together on this, on, on other things, on trying to find ways in which we can present to the society a pretty good result, as a pretty good result, and not as a failure. And I think that this is an extremely delicate and important issue. Then, almost, uh, almost in terms of practicality, imagine that uh, all that fish, there's, there's no commercial value for it, and you have to land it, can't throw it back, so what do you do? So the question is, it's fine to oblige fishermen not to um, discard to the sea uh, unwanted fish. But once it is caught at the fishing activity, it is impossible to catch only what you want. What do you do with it? You just land it in a port and let it rot and smell of, of rotten fish. I mean, is this the solution? No. What do we do? Then, if you are in Denmark, you bring it, you sell it to a fish manufacturer. Easy. If you are in a Greek island, what do you do? The only thing you can do with the fish in every time is to send it to the local restaurant. There's no other use. So what do you do? Big problem. And then an associated debate with it, the reaction, and this is very typically European and very typically European Union, we got a problem, we don't know how to resolve it. Well, we give plenty of public money for fishermen so they can at least have public funding to find a solution for themselves. But then the question is that. But why has the European taxpayer actually have to intervene to pay for this? 
and then we have the debate that for the time being is not making a lot of noise, but it will make a lot more noise in the future, as we see the results of And then, well, another question, which is very funny, well, who's going to control this? Huh? Because uh, either you put observers on board of the vessels, um, something you can only develop in large vessels, but only in small vessels, who's going to control this? This is a CCTV camera that is used in certain member states, Denmark, for example, Denmark they are promoting this, but then we want to install it in German vessels and the German terrorists and the German terrorists. But this is against the German constitution to have you know, a camera basically looking at what German citizens are doing or they know in the, in the workplace. So what do we do? And therefore, is this something that we will be able to control or is this going to become a policy that is nice on paper but actually that nobody is controlling? So those are. And then perhaps I think that over and beyond everything else, the real question I think this is, I drew it from the uh, Brexit talk tomorrow, but it, to be fair, actually, it does not apply only to the United Kingdom. Although it will apply particularly now that they did. But actually, what I said before, all member states are very happy being able to blame Brussels for it. So if we take the regionalization in which member states, in groupings, regional groupings of member states will have to take a number of decisions, they will be fully responsible for that, not Brussels anymore. Are they happy actually to play ball and to do something and receive the direct criticism of their decision instead of saying for every criticism, look at Brussels? This is a big issue as well. Are member states really going to play? And this is, I think, my last. So um, I don't know uh, if you have any questions on either the fisheries or on the policy making side. That's it.
but they will be part of gradual small efforts on a daily basis for several years. And that was really the change of paradigm that allowed the union to actually change the situation, which was quite shameful in terms of the, our failure to manage our resources properly, into a net improvement. I talk about net improvement, but we are still far from the objective. One of the things that we did in the reform, I didn't mention it because this is two months features now. I thought it was not so significant in, in terms of policy making. But we have established the objective that all stocks in Europe, all regulated stocks, should be at the level of maximum sustainable yield by 2020. So we have now a kind of multi-annual perspective to get there. We have a clear objective and a clear deadline. So I think now all the efforts can be done on a gradual basis if you have a stock that is in a very poor state, you don't need to reduce by 90% of its right here. You can say, well, I reduce it 20% this year, and then in 2017, another 20%, in 2018, another 20%, and I get before 2020 to the objective. Then, the uh, uh, examples you mentioned, I think when and where we have long-term plans, we are succeeding to recover the resources. Then, Bluefin Tuna and Atlantic, I think this is a big success story. I'm not sure this is a great story, but I, I can tell you the whole story. Of it. But I think that you have to take into account that Bluefin Tuna is not decided by the EU. This is decided in ICAT, which is a multilateral organization with nearly 50 members, and therefore we have to compromise there. I think that the quota system established in ICAT for Bluefin Tuna is good enough to allow for a clear recovery of the balance of the stock. So it is a success story. Of course, if you fish less, you could recover the stock much quicker. It's a question of balancing out the quick, the quickness of recovery with the minimizing the disruption in the economic activity. And that's a balance that we think it is reasonable. Of course, the NGOs are not satisfied. And if you close the fishery, the abundance will come back much earlier. Of course, you do. But then, if you close the fishery, you disrupt jobs, economic activity, and so on. Fisheries management is not just about biology, it's about economics and social affairs as well. Yes. Were there, uh, were there any specific examples or case studies of uh, natural resource management success in Europe that was drawn upon or drawn upon for? Well, I think it's probably, yeah, probably beyond fisheries, not many because. Fisheries are the only biological resources that are managed at your level. So, for example, forestry is, is, is not an EU policy. Then, whether, for example, the forest uh, resources are well managed in member states, that's entirely a, a national affair. I think that another policy that is mixed competence is the preservation of biodiversity. It's not exactly resources, but if you like, it's protecting the biodiversity of Europe. And this is a mixed competence in which we have a policy that consists of establishing minimum standards. So we don't tell member states what they should do, but we have directives that establish minimum standards. And then member states are fully responsible to implement this. Has this been a success? Not so much. I think this has been a little bit disappointing. Why? Because unlike the fisheries policy where we have a number of instruments to discipline member states, and particularly uh, discipline the laggards. In mixed competence, we don't have that kind of instrument. Basically, if, for example, there is a directive that calls member states to protect all the areas under the, their national jurisdiction that have a very high ecological value. If it is clear that a member state is not doing the job, and the union knows about it, certain area, high biodiversity, highly appreciated, highly publicized by NGOs, and is not being subject to protection according to the directive, what Brussels can do, what the European institutions can do, is to take that member states to the Court of Justice. But the Court of Justice may take 10 years in basically adopting a ruling. So it is a kind of very soft policy. And there's plenty of cases in the courts and plenty of sanctions of this kind. But the instrument is so low that it is actually very dangerous. And in fact, all our colleagues responsible for the environmental policy have a tremendous envy 
of the instruments we have in the fisheries policy. Because as an exclusive uh, policy, we have much quicker and much more efficient um, uh, mechanisms to discipline member states. Another question is whether we use them promptly and properly. That's another question. Because, um, yeah. uh, sorry for yeah, sure. um, dragging this out. Because <laughs> uh, I, I just, and granted, I know that Norway is not part of the EU, but um, I, I can't stop thinking about the Norwegian ox and how the industry will will be taxed, essentially pay into this fund, and then the fund is there provided for the industry to then apply and, and install um, you know, equipment or machinery that's more, uh, that's, that's meeting the needs to lower um, measurement oxide emissions. So, uh, I mean, it's, like you were saying, it's really hard with a biological resource um, in fisheries and, and monitoring. Uh, I think is the biggest issue here, but I was just trying to think of another framework to try and apply it to and, and see, you know, what it, if there could be minor tweaks that could be made instead of having to recreate it only. Yeah. No, I think there, there's certainly a number of tweaks that can be done, but it is difficult to do this for the whole of Europe. I think what you have to think is that Norway is a country that I admire a lot, but what they do is much easier, is so much easier to do in Norway than it is to do it in Ireland or in my home region of Canada. For several reasons. First of all, Norway is a huge country geographically with huge coast, huge resources, and five million people. So the density of people and the needs of the citizens of Norway and the relationship between each Norwegian citizen and the amount of fish at his disposal is completely different than in the rest of it. So that they have a kind of luxury of having a lot of fish per head. That certainly facilitates things. Secondly, they are a very rich country with oil and gas resources. So they could, if they wish, which they don't, could buy out all fishermen away from the fishing activity, pay them a, a state subsidy, and give them a very good living without actually going to fish. They actually don't do this because they are intelligent enough that they need these people actually to be busy working to protect the social fabric of the coastal communities. But I think that at the end of the day, what they can do, and I've been in Norway a few times, what they can do has two elements. Has an element of being a very forward-looking society that I admire, and a society that really sees their future as a consequence of preserving all their natural assets. And they do it very seriously. So that's the part I admire. But then they have another part that is not applicable in the rest of the world, which is this kind of relationship between a low population and very abundant resources. Um, if you go to other areas of Europe, for example, and uh, there's, there's plenty of examples, um, the political level believes that um, the fisheries management should not be directed at ensuring the rationality of the activity. Economic rationality, what is that? The objective is to ensure that those local populations there stay as fishermen. As I have plenty of anecdotes, but I remember that a French politician who told me that they didn't want a buyout scheme, even the idea of you know paying a fisherman to stop being a fisherman and getting away from that and sort of lower the pressure on the natural resources. He said, no, even if there's all the money in the world, I don't want to do that because I don't want my fishermen to become pizza yolks. They don't want the fishermen to become something else. The privacy in ensuring that even if this is economically unreasonable and not rational, they want it to continue being fishing because this is preserving the culture, preserving all the traditions, preserving all the social structure of those um, uh, coastal communities. And then when you have this, you can't possibly take example in what the Norwegians do. So I think that you know Europe is so diverse. Yeah, please. Perhaps I'm not answering to your question. No, no, no. I just, no, you are. It's just, uh, yeah, at the end of the day, Norway is just such a, a unique example. Absolutely. Uh, it's sort of fine. Absolutely. Yes. I'm wondering to how many species of fish the policy applies, and if you feel like you've got enough scientific data available to get at maximum sustainable yield and properly manage the stocks. Okay. Um, 
I will give you two answers, Atlantic and Mediterranean. It's a bit too long to explain the differences, but we have actually the common fisheries policy is the one that applies to the Atlantic. Then in the Mediterranean, yes. Then in the Atlantic, we manage uh, a bit more than 100 stocks, which mean, doesn't mean 100 species. It means about 50 species, of which they have seven different stocks in different areas. And uh, for those, we have analytical scientific advice on MSY for nearly 60%. Then we have 30% more or less, which we call data core, on which we don't have real estimates of MSY, uh, but we have proxies for MSY that we have been developing over the last few years. And then you have a certain percentage, which are minor stocks of secondary importance, and all the scientific community in the EU is so saturated doing what they do that there is no human or financial resources to actually invest on them. And then we have this 10% of stocks for which we have just some cut statistics and that's about it. But I think that for those stocks actually, this is perhaps the best, the perfect example of what I said before uh, of a, real, a pretty good policy being presented as a paper. If you take, for example, Pollock in the Irish Sea, secondary species. No scientific advice, only cut statistics. Frankly, if we get all our main stocks to MS1 and Pollard, we don't know, that's a pretty good result. I would be satisfied, I would be happy with that. But then NGOs say, well, all 100% of regulated stocks in MS1 is Pollard and MS1. No, you need to know about it, big policy paper. See what Then you move to the Mediterranean, and that's a different thing altogether. There, how many species we have? Well, commercial species actually we have uh, about uh, 60 or so. But then we don't even have a good uh, scientific advice on stock delimitation. So what we have is, you know, number of species multiplied by statistical areas, and that's how many stock we have, 300. And we can't possibly handle uh, 300. So we have to do the job of sort of bringing down that number into a smaller number of the key stocks that we can say, if we get the job done right on these stocks, well, that's about it. And then if we still have a problem of lack of scientific advice and lack of good management for the secondary stocks, okay, well, that would be a happy money here. Yeah. But nobody will be the same. So the question in the Mediterranean is that, for a number of reasons, that would be a bit too long to explain, and perhaps too technical, but if we don't have the kind of uh, EPA kind of analysis that we have for the well-evaluated uh, stocks. So we have basically different proxies of level of fishing mortality that we have in about 25 stocks. More. So basically in the Mediterranean, we still have to achieve the objective of MSY 2030, we have really to bring down the ambition to the key stocks, improve the proxies of MSY, and then do a tremendous job, which is actually to bring down fishing pressure, which in, in the Mediterranean is still far too high. And it is almost an impossible task to get there on MSY levels, even for the main stocks. Another reason to, be, to worry a little bit about whether the reform can actually be applied in the real world. In the Mediterranean, almost impossible. I was. Um how is monitoring done? Like, how do, you, how do you even come up with the data of what's being discarded? I mean, you mentioned observers and cameras, but that was that was after the fact, right? Like, how do you how do you determine what's going on? I think through sampling programs, particularly with scientific observers on board. And uh, in a few cases, we have basically two methodologies. Uh, on certain fisheries, the best uh, study ones, we have scientific observers on board. And on board, who are basically literally measuring witnessing everything that happens on the vessel and measuring levels of discard. Then we have a second methodology that works in limited circumstances and in a rather patchy way, which is through cooperation with the industry. And for example, some of my friends and the old marine biologists have been able to establish, for example, a very nice methodology, which is the second law book. You know, the official law book is where you have to note everything you catch and so on and so forth. But many uh, skippers 
the corporation of the scientists had a secret notebook, which is not for the authorities, because perhaps it may contain information that is made of the, according to the rules. And they know exactly what everything that they are fishing before putting the official figures. So they're given, they're given, they're not going to be prosecuted. They come to a deal. No, exactly. They That's come the deal. to a deal. And the scientists and the scientists say, well, I use this just generic information. I'm not going to denounce anything. And I know, I know I have good friends who have been doing this and getting excellent data on where they were discovered. But this is, the result is that we have a very patchy teacher. Because we know everybody has been able to do this. So we have many fisheries who have, where, which are extremely data poor in terms of discarding. Others that are very rich, and others, and this is very curious, have been have been data rich for a period of time and they discovered my and I will refer to one particular case, so which, which illustrates the difficulty of, of, of estimating this, is the Dutch fleet of um, that fish for, for flatfish in the North Sea. Thanks to uh, a few good uh, Dutch scientists, they were actually giving exact data of everything was happening. But then there were these data were showing that the amount of discarding of plates in the salt fishery were so big. That when the data started to be published, there was an outcry against it. How can you possibly be wasting so much with fish? And then they say, well, are we cooperating with scientists only to get about press? Forget about it. End of the story or provide it. So I think this is extremely tricky. You need obs scientific observers on board. Some people even say, some scientists say that from the moment on which there is a scientific observer on board, the behavior of the speaker is no longer the same. So these people will not even be telling you exactly what happens in a vessel without the observer. And then you get this kind of, um, uh, sort of relationship of trust between industry and scientists. And this is very patchy and complete. You need a special kind of skipper and a special kind of, special kind of scientist to actually do this. And the picture we have in terms of availability of data is still today very patchy. Okay. Maybe I can follow up that is given that do you build I know that you know in a lot of EU um, regulations kind of cautionary principle is very strong. Do you build in some buffer that like that your targets aren't wrong? You know, so that if you think MSY should be fifteen thousand tons, you make it thirteen thousand because you know there's gonna be cheating. I mean how, how do you build in the, the cheating and the uncertainty into Good, good question. That obliges us to get a little bit into the mentalities, but um, actually that boils down to the discussion that is still ongoing on whether the MSY concept as a policy objective should be considered or should be worked out as a target or as a limit. And the law doesn't say anything about this. So we are taking this, in fact, as a target, which means no buffer. In other words, we are targeting MSY but given the obvious uncertainty about whatever happens with natural resources, if you target MSY, you have a 50% chance of being above MSY or below MSY. NGOs are putting a lot of pressure on saying that no, MSY should not be a target, it should be a limit. So you should actually aim much lower in terms of fishing activity so that you are sure that whatever your real fishing mortality deployed it does not go beyond MSY. But then the question is that this is fine to say it conceptually, but in the real world, this means another thing, which is that, well, but surely if you use it as a limit, it cannot be 100%. If you want to be sure 100% chance that you're not going to hit MSY levels, then you close all these things. That's the only way to be sure you don't uh, overshoot the limit. But then, if this is not workable, then what is your percentage? And there is nothing in the law about this. So this is a, a, a matter that will end up having to, to work out. Because if the law doesn't say whether this is a, a limit or a target. But using it as a, as a target, but at some stage, I think that in many cases, we may have to introduce it as a limit. And then, the notion of MSY as a limit carries the notion of probability of not overshooting. And then, what is it? It's 95%. 90%, 51%, which one is? Unless you determine that, you cannot work out the notion of MSY 
will have to do that. But it's not done. Do you get much um, push for regulation from fishermen themselves? Because if the fishery collapses and they have collapsed, the people being negatively affected the most are the fishermen? Well, this is, you know, this is a very good question because this is the theory. Um, a lot of times the fishing industry tells us that. Don't try to impose this because we are the ones affected by a collapse of the fishery, so we'll come up with a solution. So intellectually this is true, but in my long experience it doesn't work that way. Well. For a number of reasons, hmm? because the industry has a tendency to deny the problem until the last minute. I think part of the problem is that, as the scientists, fishery scientists say, the fishermen are extremely bad samplers. Fishermen know how to find a fish where, 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 where it is, but they cannot, they do not sample in all area distribution of fish to know how much of it it is left. I have seen a certain number of fisheries collapsing. We have mostly herring in the 1970s. We have a cod in the eastern coast of Canada, in the Napo area, in the Flemish Cup area, what happens with these fisheries? That as the biomass of the bottom of the stock collapsed and reduced, you didn't have a lower density of fish in the area of distribution. You basically had the area of distribution of the stock shrinking and concentrating in certain spots. So fishermen are extremely skillful in finding those spots. So until the very end of a collapse, fishermen keep telling you, well, there's plenty of fish. I remember the case of the cod in the uh, Canadian coast, mm -hmm. and some European uh, fishermen, when scientists were saying, well, the cod, the cod is collapsing. What are, what are you talking about? In my last fishing trip, six months there, the abundance was as high as, as, as in, in, any other time. But this guy was basically fishing in the very last concentration of cod. Next year, it was seen. So fishermen are very bad samples. And insofar as their catch rates, their capacity to fish, the fish that keeps, it sort of continues, they will tend to deny their shock. Of course, this is an oversimplification. In some of the cases, there's more sophisticated fishermen who actually do recognize the very problem. But I think that the self-awareness of fishermen to actually act in a case of fisheries depletion is severely hampered in my personal experience. I've seen this so many times because of the fact that the fishermen are not interested in how much fish is there around. Is that how much fish they can actually fish when they go for it. And I think that this, the picture they get is not necessarily the same picture as the scientists that are getting that are basically systematically something. And say, well, the few fish left are concentrating in this area. In the rest of it, there's not. So that idea that you express is, if you like, what intellectually should be. But in practice, I haven't seen it very many times.